Order. Before proceeding, I wish to refer to events of last Thursday. Last Thursday there was a debate in the House about the constitutional and House practice issues concerning the abolition of age limit on payment of the superannuation guarantee charge bill 2011 introduced into the House by the member for McCullough. In the course of the debate on this matter, as well as going to the specific issues concerning the bill, a number of members commented on and in some cases sought clarification more generally on what are money or appropriation bills. They also sought clarification about the roles and rights of each of the two houses and private members of this house in relation to such bills. I believe this was a very important debate and I can understand the desire of some members for greater clarification of these issues. These matters now have been raised and debated on a number of occasions in this parliament. They are important to private members as they seek to maximise their opportunities to pursue policy matters that are of interest to them. They are no less important to government because of its legitimate interests. My role as Speaker is to explain and apply consistently and as best I can House practice in respect of the financial initiative. House practice encapsulates relevant constitutional provisions and standing orders. The issues surrounding the financial initiatives are complex. For this reason, and in response to the request from members for clarification, the Clerk's Office has produced a comprehensive note on the matter. The note builds on the advice provided earlier this year in relation to the origination of bills. It refers to the roles and responsibilities of private members of the House. I present a copy of the note, which I understand has been circulated to all members. A more specific note on the abolition of age limit on payment of the superannuation guarantee charge bill 2011 has been produced. I present a copy of this note, which I also understand has been circulated to members. All right. Order, order, slow down. I, that's why I qualified by saying I understand and I'm sure it will now be circulated. And having been circulated, I trust these notes are useful in clarifying the more general issues surrounding the financial initiative and the question of money or appropriation bills. In relation to the abolition of age limit on payment of the superannuation guarantee charge bill 2011, two issues are raised by the bill relating to the financial initiative. The need for an appropriation for the bill and the extension of a charge that results from the bill. Both issues are a consequence of the bill enlarging the classes of persons to whom an appropriation and a charge could apply. I will not go into the detail of these issues as they are outlined in the second note I have presented. Under the characterisation of bills that has been followed in the House, this bill appears to be caught by the provisions of Standing Order 179A and Standing Order 180C. Accordingly, I do not believe that it can proceed in its current form. The Manager of Opposition Business. I was just getting a book, Mr Speaker. Oh, so <laughs> have, you, have you completed your... Um... No, I have, to, I have no? completed have... my statement. <laughs> It was, a, it was a reflex action. The, the, the member for Macmillan. On indulgence? Well, the member for Macmillan has the call. Thank you. Um, I refer to page uh, 30, 37, item 61 of the member's uh, recognition of the authority of the Speaker. Yesterday in the House, uh, during question time, Speaker, you stood on your feet. Uh, that at that point, uh, members are required to be silent and take their place. 
That didn't happen on both sides of the House. My experience, which is not good in that regard, with the former Speaker, uh, had me removed from the House very quickly after I was inadvertently at that time speaking to another colleague. Of course, I wasn't calling out, I was actually speaking to another colleague, very similar to the um, uh, uh, member who was about to get a book. Um, it should be noted by all members that when the Speaker stands, if they are found speaking, they will be removed from the House. Is that correct? That, that, that is correct. And, and, um, first of all, I thank, thank the member for Macmillan for um, <coughs> using his experiences in this place uh, to remind uh, members of their obligation. Um, he, he might be unsurprised that I have no re recollection of the incident because there are many things that have happened this week that uh, uh, there are so many things that have happened this week that I can't remember all of them that, that have actually happened. But um, if he, uh, if the events occurred as he characterised them, um, the way that he has indicated members should have behaved is absolutely correct, based, based on the precedents and practice of this place, which go back to the precedents and practice of Westminster. The manager of opposition business. Yes, now I'm not reaching for a book, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I note your um, statement to the House, and I take it from your statement that you're ruling that the uh, uh, bill, uh, the member for McKellar's bill, the abolition of the age limit on payment of super guarantee charge bill 2010, cannot be proceeded with. And I've ascertained from the leader of the House that he doesn't intend to uh, move a motion to that effect, as he has occurred on the previous two occasions on the regional students uh, bill and on the uh, bill to do with increasing the pension. Having ascertained that, uh, I reluctantly, but I feel necessarily on behalf of the opposition, move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Hold it. I just... No, wait a minute. He has made a ruling. His ruling no, can't no, proceed hold, with the bill. Hold it. Hold it. I, I can, on this occasion, and, and you know that I don't do this often, uh, if you just permit me to uh, liaise with the, the clerk, be, because this is a, an issue that I want to. Char I, I have characterised that this may be um, described as an advisory ruling, which, which is something that I have tried to, uh, tried to avoid. And I'm. And, well, the member for McCalla can shake her head all she likes. I am trying to get through to this with no trickery, pokery pokery. If I've been asked whether I consider this a ruling or a statement, and I'm, I am going to seek advice from the clerk. We'll wait patiently. Yeah, no, no, no I'm... <laughs> I don't think it'll take long. <clears throat> Um, I, I was happy. I was happy that. Well, I thought that I was making a, a statement, and I'm happy for it to be um, looked upon a, as as a ruling. I I had expected that that it becomes a ruling when there was something you know before us, or there were other attempts to do do something. But um, if it if if it assists the the house, I'm happy to put on the record. That it is a ruling, and that becoming a ruling, uh, the manager of opposition business is open to do whatever he wishes to do. So, the manager of opposition business has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that. And may I say at the beginning of uh, of my remarks on this dissent motion that usually dissent motions in a speaker's ruling are moved in the heat of uh, a heat of battle. Uh, in question time or other times during the day because uh, emotions are running high and the opposition uh, disagrees fundamentally with the Speaker's call on a particular matter. On this occasion, uh, I move dissent in your ruling, uh, not with any sense of, uh, of anger uh, or, uh, or outrage, uh, but because it is the only mechanism available to the opposition uh, to put uh, on record uh, its disagreement with uh, the stance that the Speaker has taken on this occasion with respect to uh, a, an important bill that is before the House. As you alluded to in your note, Mr Speaker, uh, this is not the first time we have debated the issue of 
uh, appropriations bills on, or uh, bills that are not appropriations bills in, in the opposition's mind being uh, before the House, and whether the House of Representatives can uh, deal with those uh, bills uh, or whether the House of Representatives is incapable of dealing with those bills. And, uh, we had this debate uh, over the uh, youth allowance bill uh, that I moved in this House, and we had this debate uh, over the increase in pension bill, uh, which was moved during the uh, period that uh, Brendan Nelson was the leader of the opposition. And so this is the first uh, most comprehensive uh, treatment of the, this fundamental issue uh, that we've had the opportunity to debate uh, in a calm, considered way. And I appreciate the note that, from the, that the clerks have produced. It is an excellent note. It is well researched and well written. And I appreciate the spirit in which you have made your statement to the House. And I also appreciate the fact that it is, it is a statement made uh, in an entirely non-partisan way in an attempt to inform the House of what uh, this speaker believes uh, is our uh, power uh, and what is within our capacity to deal with in the House of Representatives. But we fundamentally disagree with the proposition that the abolition of the age limit on payment of superannuation guaranteed charge bill 2010 cannot be proceeded with in this House. We believe in the opposition that while uh, it is certainly the case that under the Constitution and the standing orders uh, only the executive can present bills to the Governor-General for assent, uh, that, it, that does not mean that the House of Representatives cannot deal with any matter it chooses to deal with uh, that it seeks to put before it. Our view is that the members of the House of Representatives uh, are sovereign in their capacity to address and deal with any matter. This is a very important uh, debate, Mr. Mr Speaker, because it, it deals with the relationship between the executive and the Crown, it deals with the relationship between the parliament and the executive, and it deals with the relationship between the people and the parliament. And it's the opposition's view that the people elect a parliament of 150 members of the House of Representatives uh, amongst those members of the parliament, an executive is appointed by the Governor-General to advise them uh, on uh, how to govern the nation, and the executive uh, has a relationship with the Crown, which is quite separate and apart from the parliament. That is how our constitution and how our nation has been governed since 1901 and before that in the colonies. The Crown has a particular relationship with the executive, which it doesn't have, which it doesn't have with the parliament, and the opposition has never claimed and does not claim today that we have the power as a parliament to direct the governor general how to act or to direct a member of the executive what to advise the governor general. But we do have a right as a parliament to address and deal with any matter we seek to put before ourselves. We have the capacity to pass it, to amend it, to defeat it or decide to lay it on the table. But, there is that we, but we do not believe in the opposition that the Speaker has the capacity to direct the parliament as to whether it can or cannot proceed with a bill. And I particularly appeal to the uh, members of the crossbenchers who have made as their cause celeb uh, over the last nine months the capacity of private members in this House. The member for Line particularly has commented on many occasions in this place about the sovereignty of private members and their capacity to represent their constituents. And I'm sure uh, the member for New England would share the same views as would the member for Denison, the member for O'Connor, uh, the member for Kennedy and the member for Melbourne. On that basis, uh, our argument is very simple. And our argument is this, that while the executive decides what to advise the Governor-General and what bill should be presented to the Governor-General for assent, uh, it is the parliament that can decide any matter before it and dispose of it. Absolutely. So we do dissent from your ruling, Mr Speaker. We dissent from your ruling because it is the only mechanism that we have before us to get a vote in this House uh, on whether the abolition of the age limit on payment of super guarantee charge bill can proceed. This is a very important debate for our, our parliament because it goes very much to the whole basis of the Westminster system over many hundreds of years. And our forebears who uh, established the traditions upon which our parliament is based 
would have fought very, very strongly, very powerfully for the right to consider any matter we choose to put before us. This is not a light matter. Uh, an English civil war was fought over the relationship between the parliament and the people and the crown and the executive. The English civil war in the 17th century was not a light matter about a, a particular king uh, who had a disagreement uh, with a, a particular group of people led by Oliver Cromwell and many others. It was actually a war over whether the parliament had the capacity to act and its relationship with the crown. And the parliament won that civil war and the relationship between the crown and the parliament and the executive was established at that time and reaffirmed the don't be so Morton. pathetic member and reaffirmed Morton. in 1688 in the glorious revolution as it was called when James II was removed by the parliament and replaced with a different sovereign because again the relationship if you don't understand the basis of the traditions of the Westminster system, it's not my the job to Morton, tell you. The member and for in 1688, the Parliament the reaffirmed its Sturt power. It reaffirmed its power and its relationship between itself, the executive, and the crown. And that relationship, set in Westminster in the 17th century, is the same relationship that we have today, in 2011, that has stood through the last hundreds of years, and it is not a light matter for the parliament to decide that it cannot deal with a matter that we would like to put before it. For that reason, while some, uh, some members of the Labor Party think these are trivial issues, while some Order, members member of the Labor Party, is while some members of the the Labor Party believe day. that uh, uh, the 24-hour the, the news cycle should determine how we operate in this parliament, or even the 12-hour news cycle and think that it's simply a, a, a game of sport of who's winning at any particular time. The truth is that these, these matters are of great import to the relationship that this parliament has with the executive and the relationship between the executive and the crown, and they should be taken very seriously. The speaker has taken them seriously. The speaker has spent the last week deliberating on this matter. He did not rule last Thursday that the bill could not proceed, and I think that the Leader of the House has taken these matters seriously as well, uh, because he hasn't pushed the Speaker on this matter. He has allowed the Speaker to come to a view. The Speaker has, taken, has quite properly sought the um, input of the clerks, and a, a paper has been produced. The Speaker has made a decision. We disagree with the Speaker's ruling, and that this motion that's before the Chair is that the part that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from so that the uh, power of the parliament, uh, the prerogative of the parliament, uh, the sovereignty of the people can be upheld, and that is why we have put this dissent motion. We don't seek to direct the executive. We don't seek to direct the crown. What we are doing in this, uh, by putting these bills, which some characterise as appropriation bills, and I note others do not, the president of the Senate. Senator Hogg does not characterise these bills as appropriation bills. The Senate does not characterise these bills as appropriation bills. The Senate takes the view that because an appropriation is already in the parliament, because there's appropriations already placed in the parliament for uh, these matters, that therefore this is not a new appropriation and therefore the Senate could deal with such a bill. So why would it be that the Senate, that the Senate has greater power than the House of Representatives. It's simply uh, absurd to suggest that the Senate would uh, give itself more powers than the House of Representatives, which is, of course, the People's House. And while the, the people vote for the Senate, the, the different voting system means that the members of the House of Representatives can most Order. properly be characterised as Order. the People's House. So the I urge people to support the dissent motion. Is, um, is the motion seconded? The member for McCullough. Um, <coughs> Mr. Speaker. In seconding the motion, I would like to uh, echo the um, uh, comments made by the Leader of Opposition Business that this is in no way uh, a reflection on you, but it is in fact a very important constitutional issue, uh, an important question for whether or not this House is in charge of its own agenda. Uh, and as the, uh, the Manager of Government Business has refused to move any motion, the only mechanism we have for debating this issue is to move a dissent from your ruling. 
Now, I want to make two points. Your ruling is saying that you are upholding standing orders which say that a bill may only be introduced by the government. The problem is, Mr Speaker, that the bill has already been introduced. The bill is alive and before this parliament, and indeed the selection committees, which uh, was set up under the new paradigm where all the crossbenchers said there must be a voice for private members' business. This was an important tenant uh, that they agreed to support the government on. And that committee, which you chair, has recommended that that bill be listed for a <clears throat> vote on its second reading. The government acted in defiance of your ruling or your recommendation last week and failed to list the bill. The only way it was brought on was by suspending standing orders, which we agreed to, and we then had the debate on that motion and not on the second reading. The government had two speakers. Uh, after I introduced the bill on a first reading, it subsequently came in and the second reading was commenced. So the bill is already here. The, uh, <clears throat> on the second reading, the government had two speakers speak uh, in that second reading debate. Not one of them raised an issue, the constitutional issue, that this was an appropriations bill. Not one. At no stage was this issue raised in this House. It was not raised from the chair, it was not raised by the government, and the debate went on. We argued the merits of the bill. It is only when it came to the suspension vote that we were able to voice uh, the fact that the government was now raising this question uh, and wanted to somehow knock out the bill. It sent around a little cheat sheet for the independents to use, and those independents who spoke did not at all comment on the proposition that I made, which I believe is the only sensible way out of this dilemma. And I said that the way that this matter could proceed is that the bill should receive a second reading vote and that in consideration in detail, the government could then move an amendment which would um, say that the bill would not come into force until it moved an appropriations bill and undertake to so do. That is a way around this dilemma because the bill is already in this place. It has, not been, uh, it has been debated and it is awaiting a vote. Now, when it comes to section 56 of the Constitution, uh, Mr McClelland, in his advice to you, uh, dated this, um, February when we were dealing with the uh, income support for regional students, uh, the, he points out that section 56 states that such laws shall not be passed until the purpose of the appropriation has been recommended by the message of the Governor-General to the House in which they were originated. Quite right. But that message does not come until after the second reading vote has been held. And I am putting to you, Mr Speaker, that there is, by ruling uh, on uh, the two standing orders, it's too late. It's post facto. It's too late. The fact is that the bill is already in this place and it must proceed to a second reading. What happens after that is another matter. We would then move to consideration in detail. The question of six, section 56 could be raised. The government could accept my proposition. Now, I was very disappointed when those members of the crossbenchers who did speak uh, on last week on the suspension motion did not address that point that I raised at all. You simply addressed the matters uh, that the government had put in their little sheet that they sent around, and I was most disappointed because I like to think that the independents do consider things uh, in, uh, uh, in all seriousness, and it is not too late. It's not too late. You could consider— you didn't speak, uh, uh, Mr Windsor, Mr. the member for New England. I deliberately only mentioned those Order. who did. And you can't hide Order. behind that pile the of papers. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by the member for Sturt of Dissent be agreed to. The Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, 
I rise to support your ruling and to express the ongoing confidence of the government uh, in your speakership, Mr Speaker. <coughs> I think it is very good that today we have uh, some clarification, both in terms of the short-term issue that uh, was before the House last Thursday, but also the longer-term uh, rulings that are uh, required. This is a very simple issue here. This goes to the operation of the Constitution, the Standing Orders and House of Representatives practice. It goes to the way that our form of government operates, which is that only the executive uh, can appropriate uh, money. It goes to good governance. If it is the case that, that each issue, uh, one by one, can be Order. considered without having the context of the overall fiscal position, then you will certainly not have, you will not have a return of the budget to surplus in 2012-13. Order. The Leader of the House has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Constitution and, and uh, House of Reps practice are very clear. Firstly, um, the Constitution uh, is enshrined very clearly uh, under sections uh, 53 and 56. That makes it very clear, very clear in terms of uh, the way that money bills come before the House. Uh, section 53 says this, proposed laws appropriating revenue or monies or imposing taxation shall not originate in the Senate. That's a section of the Constitution that from time to time people in the Senate have uh, sought to express a different view on. Uh, that is uh, understandable that from time to time people will uh, try to increase uh, the importance of uh, the chamber in which they reside. It's not one that's ever been supported by this House of Representatives, <laughs> nor should it be. But Section 56 reinforces that. A vote, resolution or proposed law for the appropriation of revenue or money shall not be passed unless the purpose of the appropriation has in the same session been recommended by message of the Governor-General to the House in which the proposal originated. It's very clear, Mr Speaker, there is no message from the Governor-General with this legislation. Very clear. And it's quite clear from the speeches of the member from McKellar and others that uh, this bill, were it to be passed, uh, would indeed require additional monies to be expended. The financial initiative of the executive is enshrined not just in the Constitution, but also in the House of Representatives and standing orders. House of Representatives practice has been used in this chamber since this chamber was formed. Page 408 makes it very clear. It clearly outlines the financial initiative of the executive. It says this, the executive government is charged with the management of revenue and with payments for the public service. It is a long established and strictly observed rule which expresses a principle of the highest constitutional importance that no public charge can be incurred except on the initiative of the executive government. The executive government demands money. The House grants it, but the House does not vote money unless required by the government. Very clear in House of Representatives practice. They're in black and white for all to see, and the manager of opposition business knows this to be the case. Page 431 of practice goes on to deal with section 53 of the Constitution and the limitations on the Senate powers of amendment. Further, page 567 of House of Representatives practice says this, a private member may not initiate a bill imposing or varying a tax requiring the appropriation of revenue or monies. This would be contrary to the constitutional and parliamentary principle of the financial initiative of the executive that is, no public charge can be incurred except on the initiative of the executive. So it makes it very clear. Page 568 of practice says this. It would not be possible for a private member to obtain the Governor-General's recommendation for an appropriation. Furthermore, of those bills requiring a Governor-General's message, only those brought in by a minister may be introduced and proceeded with before the message is announced. 
I repeat, Mr. Speaker, only those in brought in by a minister may be introduced and proceeded with before the message is announced. It goes on to say, therefore, only a minister may bring in a bill which appropriates public monies. It can't be clearer whatsoever. It can't be clearer. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, Standing Order 179 is also very clear. Standing Order 179 uh, says very clearly, Section A, only a minister may initiate a proposal to impose, increase or decrease a tax or duty or change the scope of any charge. Or change the scope of any charge. There is no possibility that those who have moved opportunistically to dissent from your ruling can argue that this does not change the scope of, of the charge. There is no possibility that they can argue that. They know that that is the case. They know that their position is contradictory to the standing orders and to House of Representatives practice. Section 170, standing Order 179B says this. Only a minister may move an amendment to the proposal which increases or extends the scope of the charge proposed beyond the total already existing under any Act of Parliament. And C says a member who is not a minister may move an amendment to the proposal which does not increase or extend the scope of the charge proposed beyond the total already existing under any Act of Parliament. So we have a very clear position here, Mr Speaker a very clear position, backed up by the Constitution, backed up by the, uh, backed up by the, uh, the House of Representatives practice and indeed, and indeed backed up by the standing orders. Indeed, the manager of opposition business, when this issue raised its head at the end of last year in this new parliament, made it clear in public interviews that he understood, indeed, that only, that only a minister can introduce a money bill. And indeed, on a number of occasions, the manager of opposition business and other senior members of the opposition have stated that what their intention is in raising these issues is to get the government to adopt them. Is to get the government to adopt them. They say that in recognition that only a government, only a government minister can introduce money bills before this House, and only with a message from the Governor-General. And I say to you, Mr Speaker, that your ruling is absolutely correct today. I say to you that this House has continually reaffirmed, uh, without exception, without exception, this principle. And they've done so because uh, the Founding Fathers, and they were all men, were very wise when they wrote the Constitution and put in place provisions that have served this nation well. Put in place provisions, put in place provisions that have stood this nation well for 111 years. That ensures that when expenditures are approved, people know where the money is actually coming from. You can't have one-off bills not considered as part of the executive government, because if you had that, there are a range of a range of expenditures which by themselves every member of this House would support. Every member of this House would support. Who would not support, in isolation from itself, the concept of giving more money to the homeless, giving more money to the disadvantaged? But unless it's viewed in the context of a budget, which is the role of the executive government, then simply you can't have a government that is responsible, a government that puts in place appropriate economic management in the interests of this nation. Mr Speaker, we are determined to return the budget to surplus in 2012-13. That, that is why we have put forward a responsible budget. Those opposite are determined to wreck the budget surplus. They are determined to put forward opportunistic propositions for expenditure and determined to opportunistically block, block block savings measures, even when they are their own propositions, Mr Speaker, which is what you Order. see in the alternative Order. fuel debate. Order. Mr Speaker, I ask the House to express its confidence in Order. you, as they have Order. earlier this the week, and support your ruling. Expired. The member for Melbourne.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, through you, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, you and the clerks for the attention that um, you've paid to this matter and for the for the note. Um, I haven't yet had a chance to read and digest the, that note, and so I make these comments in absence of having read it. Um, Mr. Speaker, I must say at start, it is only because the motion is moved in the form of dissent for your, uh, to your ruling uh, that I will not be supporting that motion. But I do it um, in, uh, through gritted teeth because the, this should not be a matter that should be resolved uh, as to whether or not it's a matter of confidence in you. This is an important matter that goes to the role of private members in a minority parliament. Um, I agree with the member for McKellar and the Leader of, the, of Opposition Business that this is not uh, an appropriations bill. And I think that that should be something that is resolved by the House through a motion on the merits of the bill and not by way of a proxy debate through dissent in your ruling. Um, I can indicate that, especially not having had the chance to read the advice that has come, um, I can indicate to you, Mr Speaker, with great respect that I could not guarantee that I would vote the same way next time. Um, and I would also indicate to you and uh, to other members of the House that if this were a motion that were to come in some other way, other than dissent in your ruling, that would allow the House to be master of its own business and would allow these kind of uh, bills to be debated, my inclination would be to support it. The question um, of past practice and precedent is of limited relevance because every um, uh, uh, past ruling and every procedure that has been referred to, again without having read the clerk's advice, has been developed in the context of majority government. And of course, it would make sense in those instances to deal with amendments from the opposition in that way. But that is not the case we have here. And private members, whether on the cross benches or from the opposition, ought to have their full rights to move amendments or to move bills, even though the government might consider they are appropriations matters. If the House considers they're not, they should be able to be debated. And uh, so uh, I indicate, Mr. Speaker, I will not be dissenting. Um, from your ruling, but I cannot guarantee um, that that would occur in the future, and uh, I would um, hope that there is some way in which uh, a motion may come back before the House to allow this to be debated in a form that's not dissent from your ruling. The Leader of the House. Uh, I ask that leave be given to permit uh, the Attorney General, the Member for New England, and the Member for Lyme to address. The, this question for five minutes for a, a time no longer than five minutes each. Yeah. Is leave given to suspend so much of standing orders that it will allow the motion that the. Uh, yeah. Leave I is move, given. The, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would permit the Attorney General, the Member for New England, and the Member for Lyon to address this question for no longer than five minutes. The question each. is that the. <laughs> sorry. Each. Um, each. We've got the each bit. Um, the, motion is the, the question is the motion moved by the Leader of the House to suspend standing orders to allow uh, the three members to uh, speak for five minutes each. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I thank the, the House. The Attorney General. Yes, uh, I thank the House uh, also. Uh, Mr Speaker, you have, with respect, correctly identified the two issues that arise from this bill, namely, in the first case, the need for an appropriation uh, for the bill and also the extension of a charge uh, that uh, results from the bill. And you have identified both issues are as a consequence of the bill enlarging the class of persons for whom an appropriation, on the one hand, and a charge, on the other, uh, could apply. Uh, the, in dealing with the second issue first, that is in respect to a charge, and the Leader of the House uh, correctly identified that, the, that it is quite plain on its, face, on its face that Standing Order 179A necessarily applies because uh, it uh, increases the scope of a charge, and that is noted uh, in the memorandum from the clerk that the incentive for employers to pay their superannuation contribution is that if they fail to do so, fail to do so or fail to do so in full, they are liable 
for a superannuation guarantee charge. Uh, that is necessarily the case. Dealing with that uh, second issue in respect to appropriation, could I refer uh, the House, and I have uh, previously touched upon these issues, but perhaps not in great detail, to an advice of uh, Sir Garfield Barwick when he was the Attorney General on 20 February 1962. He in turn referred to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, passage from the uh, book The British Budgetary System by Sir Herbert Britton, published in 1959, and I quote from that, underlying the parliamentary procedure on, on supply is a rule of the House of Commons which is of fundamental importance. It is enshrined in a standing order which, in its earliest form, was passed in 1706 and which now, uh, according to the stand relevant standing order uh, that existed in the House of Commons, this House will receive no petition for any sum relating to public service or, pro or proposed upon any motion for a grant or charge upon the public revenue, whether payable out of consolidated fund or out of money to be provided by Parliament, unless recommended from the Crown. So the significance of that is it notes a principle going back to 1706. The Leader of the House has referred to uh, the uh, debates of our founding fathers, our constitutional fathers, who were well aware of that her heritage and adopted the same principles uh, in our constitution. And indeed, the author, that is uh, Sir Herbert Britton, uh, summarised, only the Crown, therefore, can initiate proposals for expenditure in the House uh, in the House, the Crown's right and responsibility in this respect are exercised by ministers in the government of the day, and that is reflected in Standing Order 180, which requires a message, uh, which requires a message from the Governor General, uh, and which message is given on the advice uh, of the day. The, uh, cl the uh, clerk's advice uh, appropriately refers to. Um, uh, appropriately refers to uh, Pape's case uh, by way of footnote. Uh, that was a recent decision of the uh, High Court of Australia, uh, and that also uh, confirmed, the, uh, uh, confirmed the principle. If I could also refer uh, to the, uh, uh, the fundamental principle described by the High Court in Combe's case, where the majority judgment of Justices Gummo, Hain, Callanan and Hayden noted that it is the executive government which begins the process of appropriation. This the executive government does by specifying the purpose of the appropriation by message to the House of Representatives. Again, that message comes from the Governor-General. And similarly, in that case, Justice Kirby referred to the discussion in the issue in Lane's commentary of the Australian Constitution of 1997 and concluded that the initiative for proposed appropriations belongs to the executive in accordance with section 56 of the constitution again the will of the executive being ref being referred to in the message of the governor general the governor general acting on the advice of the executive of the day so with respect mr speaker uh, your ruling is entirely consistent with the standing orders, but more than that, it is entirely consistent with our constitutional heritage. The member for Lyme. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I appreciate the House allowing an extension in this debate, and it is entirely appropriate that a motion has been put, and as is all members' rights for um, uh, some members to want to dissent from that ruling. Um, the matters of the last fortnight do weigh heavily. Um, I would hope other members are like me and are waking up in the middle of the night worrying about the standing orders and trying to work through the issues of the last two weeks. I would hope this isn't going to be um, sleepless nights of the next two years. I would hope this is a moment where we do clarify and from that stabilise um, the processes of government, not only for this parliament but for um, future parliaments. Uh, where these questions may arise. And this is therefore an opportunity, not a threat, for this parliament to resolve some of these issues. Before I talk about um, the, uh, or in relation to the motion before the House, I do want to clarify uh, the issue of the last week because it is going to be important in relation to the views in regard to this motion. I am one who does um, believe in the independence of a speaker. 
and does believe in the authority of a speaker and does have confidence in a speaker. And there may be some confusion about the position taken in regards to a naming. Uh, I do not uh, believe that anyone should vote in this place based on the implications of a future vote. And in regards to the naming, uh, in no way is that reflecting on the chair. It is weighing up the issue before uh, me as a member of parliament. And if I don't see or hear uh, the incident in question, that is not uh, uh, dissenting from uh, uh, or, or seeking a want for disorder in the House. It is uh, basically um, uh, uh, making a ruling in my end on uh, the question that is being put before me in regards to whether there was or wasn't disorder. And for whatever reason, whether it's the location that we sit in this House or uh, any other reason, I did not see or hear what happened. Um, so for that reason, uh, without that being confused, uh, with any sort of challenge to the confidence or independence of the chair, that is something that I will be referring to the procedures committee to clarify it. Because if we are serious about an independent speaker, uh, the question then is why the speaker then has to put a vote for uh, uh, to seek order in the chamber, and potentially if now in this parliament we have put in place uh, a system of an independent speaker, we could. Uh, align that with giving the speaker the authority uh, to actually uh, not only uh, uh, dis uh, dismiss someone for 24 uh, for an hour, but also potentially for an hour. So that's hopefully a question that would resolve the issue at my end and resolve the issue for this parliament. That leads into consistently the thinking behind uh, the question uh, before us. Uh, if we are to believe in the independence of a speaker and to have confidence. In, a, in the authority of a speaker, um, then this process is entirely appropriate. Uh, the motion that was uh, the bill that was put before the House had some questions around uh, its status as a money bill or not. Uh, there were several of us who asked the question as to uh, and expressed a frustration that uh, these uh, bills uh, were leaving open that question. We had constitutional. Uh, uh, well, we had questions, advice from the clerk, for example, advice from the parliamentary library that was completely contradictory. And for that reason, the speaker quite rightly uh, took on the issue of trying to resolve this issue. So, if the clerks are the clerks of the parliament and not the executive, then they have quite duly done their job of providing advice to the speaker of the parliament, not the executive, and the speaker has provided advice to the parliament that is now, I think, uh, having gone through a due process and a proper process, uh, entirely worthy of support if we are to accept that we have an independent speaker that we have confidence in. So I do. I think we do have an independent speaker who we have confidence in. I do think the process that we've gone through to get the advice that we've got is an appropriate one, and therefore I will be supporting the motion before the House. Order. The question is the motion of dissent moved by the member for Sturt be agreed to. The member for New England. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's a pile of documents. Is, uh, <laughs> no, not Don't in relation them, to your ruling. It, uh, <laughs> it is in relation to uh, the Murray Darling uh, report that will be coming up uh, soon. But I, I think this debate has, has been interesting, and I hope it does uh, go some way towards. Uh, putting in place a, a bit of a, a glide path for this particular parliament. Uh, and that's not to deny uh, the members' right in this case to, to bring a bill before the parliament, but I think we do really need some clarification. Uh, your uh, uh, rulings today in the Attorney General and uh, the uh, member for Lyon uh, have uh, given some clarification in terms of this particular issue. But if it's not determined today, I'd suggest that there does need to be uh, maybe a meeting between the two houses or some formal process set in place to try and resolve this issue, uh, because it's one that's going to continually plague this parliament, uh, where independent members in a minority parliament have de made a determination of the, the government, and the government has a right and we have actually, uh, in documentation, it would have been the same if uh, <coughs> the determination of the government had been the, uh, in the other way. The, uh, we have 
supported the right of the government of the day uh, to access supply and to uh, arrange its, uh, its uh, budgetary arrangements. So this continual uh, bringing of bills, uh, which are essentially, in my view, and in the determinations of the clerks and yourself, <coughs> through a number of rulings, uh, are supply bills or appropriation bills, does need to be clarified. Otherwise, we'll just get an avalanche of uh, more and more of these bills where that goes to the destabilisation of the budgetary process. And that might be all very well politically, and a lot of the intent of these uh, bills that are being introduced I don't think anybody uh, doubts their intent, but I think we saw a successful outcome in terms of the youth allowance. The bill didn't get through the parliament because of the same issues that are raised here, but the, issue, the, but the issues that were raised uh, were of importance that the government has initiated uh, a review of the process. So I'd suggest that maybe that's a way through this, but if it's not a way through this, maybe at some stage the House has to pass some sort of appropriation bill for one dollar so that it can be tested uh, in the courts for future reference. Uh, by that time, the hung parliament is probably well, uh, well and done with. But, uh, uh, but I'd suggest that if we can't find a formal process that actually resolves this and we have this continual round uh, of debate over this issue, that uh, uh, maybe that's a way of, of going forward. I went through exactly the same experience. Uh, with a different uh, form of government in the, the hung parliament that I was in in New South Wales when, when I supported the, uh, uh, the uh, Liberal Party on that particular occasion. Uh, they were subjected to a whole an avalanche of bills, uh, we used to call them uh, country bills for the country independent, so that uh, it would put the, the member of parliament in a difficult position in terms of determination The politics could be played in in relation to that. But on the, all of those occasions, I supported the government of the day in terms of the responsibility of supply. So I, uh, I won't be dissenting uh, in your ruling. And whilst I do have a, uh, a few seconds, I do recognise that, that there is a Chinese wall between the Speaker and the executive that's been sp spoken about on a number of occasions. The member for Braddon has, uh, has been very vocal on that, uh, that issue of, of a Chinese wall between the executive and the speaker. And I think the speaker knows uh, what I'm referring to. <coughs> but I, I uh, uh, apologise for not being in the House on the occasion the other day uh, when the vote uh, was taken uh, in relation to uh, uh, the speaker's uh, ruling. In all the parliaments that I have been in, I think on all occasions, I have always supported uh, the Speaker of the Parliament, irrespective of their, their political uh, tone, and I will continue to do that because I think uh, the independence of the Speaker is something that's, uh, that's very, very special uh, in our parliamentary uh, system. Thank you. Order. The, que the question is the motion moved by the Manager of Opposition Business of dissent in the Speaker's ruling be agreed to. The member for McCullough. No, Mr not. Speaker, may I ask you um, a question on indulgence no, relating to this matter? Um, being trying to avoid being a risk taker, I've been a risk taker, so I'll allow you on indulgence. I'm not sure whether there's an answer, but anyway, the member Thank for McCullough. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, this morning, uh, your ruling was made on the basis that you'd had advice for the clerks, and we've had debate uh, on, the, the, on the procedural motion I moved because there was nothing else I could do to uh, have the debate. Uh, can I say? It's my indulgence, indulgence Leader. Yeah. Right. My question the is this: um, I've read uh, the advice that the clerks have given to you, and at no point have they advised you on the question that this, in fact, is a live bill. None of the debate from the government or the crossbenchers has addressed that question. That this is totally different from any other circumstance. This is a bill that was, in fact, introduced, whereas the standing orders would preclude oh. it if you ruled 
Right. Matter is that is in fact yeah. being introduced, the, and no advice has been given to you on that point. The, the member, the member may resume her place. Um, a, a more sensitive and precious petal soul could suggest that that was reflecting on the way that we've made come to this decision. Um, uh, I assure you, for the last week, we just haven't been looking at the tea leaves and, and, and the written word. Um, and the member would be aware that this has been something that um, has been under discussion for even longer than the, the past week. And I assure her that I am cognisant of the fact that a process commenced and I have made my ruling. The question is that the motion of dissent moved by the Manager of Opposition Business be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the manager of opposition business of dissent in the speaker's ruling be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Barker and Parks tellers for the ayes, and the members for Fowler and Shortland tellers for the noes. Your number? <laughs> and I did.
Order. The result of the division is I 68, no 72. The question is therefore negatived. Could members please resume their places quickly and quietly? The Did you vote with us? The Leader of the House. Yes.